Hello and welcome to Bread and Thread, a podcast about food and domestic history. I'm Liz. And I'm Hazel. We are two friends who studied archaeology together and love history and making stuff and trying to make historical stuff. So what have you been making recently? Um, so I cooked something which is from the book we're talking about today. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll talk more about that later and probably put up a video. Um, but I've also been been working on my punch needle snail rug and found a free knitting pattern for the jumper from Knives Out. Knives Out is a film? It is a film. It has a very nice, very complicated cable knit jumper in it that Chris Evans wears. Excellent. Um, that is this like that jump- different cabling tables? Oh boy. <laughs> but Nick wants one, so Nick's gonna get one. Amazing. I can't wait to see the minute. It's it's, great. it's gonna be very slow going. Cause again, three different cabling tables. Yeah, that's gonna be so squishy though. Yeah. Be good to hug. <gasps> Hugging jumper. Hugging jumper. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Prepare for Nick to have people just launching themselves at them. <laughs> <laughs> what what have you been up to? Uh so I made a seed cake this morning with caraway seeds. Um, because mm. I just bought five hundred grams of caraway seeds from a website that you very helpfully gave me the name of. <laughs> um, and now I have to find a use for 500 grams of caraway seeds because turns out that's a lot uh, but the cake was delicious uh, we had some family friends like a really lovely elderly couple come over for tea in the garden and we did capital T tea with like actual teacups and granny's teapots and so oh, very nice. I, made, I made a seed cake and it was lovely yeah well, if if you remember the local larder that I did way, way back, um, it talked about different things from Lancashire that are called cakes that aren't cakes. <laughs> There's one that's basically shortbread with caraway seeds in the goosna cake, which I you should make that. It's delicious. I do remember that. And I remember them being tasty. Um, and I think I'm going to have to do that soon. Uh, if anyone has any great caraway seed recipes out there, let me know. Um, <laughs> I know it's not just cakes and stuff. It's also, you can put it in stews and things, right? Or make tea. I've heard of putting them in curry. Okay. Well, that's a stew. Yeah. Right? Yeah, this is a spicy stew. Prove me wrong. I I cannot. It's a stew. <laughs> <laughs> So we have a very exciting cookbook today. We do. It is the Suffrage Cookbook from 1915, which is available on Project Gutenberg, and I will put a link in the episode description. Excellent. So where was this published is this an american cookbook or it is yes it was okay. published by the equal franchise federation of western pennsylvania oh um and sold to raise funds for the campaign for uh women's suffrage in the u.s hmm. um the first thing I want to say about it is that it has testimonials from eight current and former governors of US states that had some level of women's suffrage by 1915. Oh! All talking about how, well, seven of them talk about how it's great because the, the women are voting for things that will help families and all that stuff. And one of them saying that if women get all of the benefits of living in a society, then they should have to vote too. <laughs> which i i love that as an argument like it's, it's kind yeah. of whatever gets you there <laughs> not, not that what i was thinking of but you know it's uh, yeah <laughs> I, 
I did awesome. make a note. It's on. Yeah, it's on page one hundred and thirty-six of the. Um, I've forgotten the, the term, but the the modern reprinting. Um, okay. So from G W Cable. As to the sentiment on equal suffrage, let me say that if I had no more generous reason for approving it, I should do so on the ground of my opposition to seeing any element of our people enjoying large liberty and influence without the restraints of a corresponding responsibility in the suffrage. I like how this guy is just like, voting sucks, you should have to do it too. I mean, like I say, what, whatever gets you there, right? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> so I've I've had a look through the sections of this book and most of the recipes seem like pretty normal, some quite old fashioned, but there are some that I have questions about. Is it the albuminous beverages? Um no, but I would also like to know about that. So, um, sorry, go yeah. ahead. The albuminous beverages are basically what would what would also have been called um, invalid drinks. Okay, it's, so it's, like beef tea and stuff. Yeah, like drink drinks for for poorly people. Um, they're called oh, albuminous yeah. because they have albumin or egg whites in. I see. Um. But you can tell that there's an element of diet culture creeping in, which I find quite interesting. Just because it's 1915, I find it interesting that it's mm -hmm. that obvious. Because it's talking about, you know, it's got all of the nutrients and things that you need if you can't keep food down. But also, here are some ways to reduce the calorie content. Uh, yeah, it's listing like how many calories are in an egg here. Yeah, like, initially I thought that the calorie count was, you know, so you can make sure that the sick people who can't eat are getting enough energy <laughs> from their food. But then it's like, and here are the ways you can make there be less calories, because hmm. I, I guess just because you're bed-bound, that's no reason to gain weight. Fun well, times! I'm you sorry, guys. But I am not doing the 1915 egg, egg drink diet. I no no a lot of them are very alcoholic as well <laughs> oh well that like, might persuade like me a bit but... eggnog recipes in here wow egg lemonade yeah there's also beef eggnog oh no <laughs> like that that's an invalid drink it's basically Bovril with egg white in it. Oh, I, that'll make you get better fast enough to not have to drink that anymore. Yeah, I just... So again, a lot of these are invalid drinks. Um, but it also says, The combination of egg, milk and sugar with alcohol, which constitutes eggnog, is apt to produce nausea and vomiting in a feeble stomach. Mm. So, which is why you should only use the egg whites because apparently it's the yolk and not the fact that there's raw egg in there that's the problem yeah maybe it's the fact that these drinks are horrible <laughs> do, you, do you have a favourite from that section um I think it might be either the beef eggnog or oh I was going to say the mulled wine but that one actually doesn't oh no it does it's the mulled wine it's the egg mulled wine yeah yes like, you took if something you nice the egg out, it sounds like quite a nice exactly <laughs> you made a nice drink recipe and then you just chucked an egg in it I think my favourite is the albuminized water for infants. <laughs> you give it give it to your small child if they're complaining that their stomach hurts. I bet they'll stop complaining. 
Wow. I bet they will. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, not a fan, I have to Ooh. say. We're not starting this off great. Yeah, I mean, what what else would you give a sick two-year-old if not raw egg and lemon juice in a glass of water? Right. Um, can we move on from albumated drinks before I start to feel queasy? <laughs> So this seems to be laid out in a sort of order of a meal kind of way. Definitely, yeah. Oh um, wow, it's pretty comprehensive. It it is, uh, although it it another thing that dates it, I think, is that there's a recipe for boiled rice, just plain boiled rice mm -hmm. in the vegetable section. How to boil rice, which, I mean, to be fair. Like, it's it's less having instructions for how to cook rice, which I'm sure lots of people in 1915 Pennsylvania didn't really know how to do. It's the fact that it's listed under vegetables. <laughs> Confirmed, rice is a vegetable. But, I mean, some of the recipes are ridiculous, like... There's a, a recipe for um, a coffee cake, which does not contain coffee. Okay. There's a recipe for carrot soup that is just carrots and water. <laughs> There's a whole um, section of sandwich recipes. Yes, I saw There's that. There's a recipe I... for grape juice, which is just juice some grapes. <laughs> okay. So, the one that I I first have questions about mm -hmm. is in the bread rolls etc section. It is hymen bread. Hymen bread, yeah. I I did make a note of that one in the contents page, which I've just looked at, and the recipe for hymen bread is one pound genuine old love. Uh, seven eighths of a pound common sense, three quarters of a pound generosity, a half a pound toleration, half a pound charity, and a pinch of humour. Always to be taken with a grain of salt. Good for three hundred and sixty-five days in the year. Now that doesn't sound like something you can slice with a bread knife. Yeah, there's there's a few recipes like that which. I, I find interesting. Um, the the first one that comes up is my favourite, though, I think, which is okay. for Amti, spelt with an I at the end, Amti's favourite hash. One pound truth thoroughly mangled. <laughs> one generous handful of injustice. Sprinkle over everything in the pan. One tumbler acetic acid well shaken. A little vitriol will add a delightful tang and a string of nonsense should be dropped in at the last as if by accident. Stir all together with a sharp knife because some of the tidbits will be tough propositions. Presumably that's anti-suffrage? I mean, I, I feel like that's more likely than, like, shipping antis. <laughs> Which is the first thing that it made me think of, I'll be honest. I thought it was a name or something, but I that make now I see. <laughs> yeah, they also have suffrage pie and um childhood fondant, which are are similar veins. Right. So some of these are just humorous recipes. Yeah. Like the the way that the recipes are written is kind of weird as well, because Obviously, a while ago, we had the Fanny Farmer recipe talking about, like, by this point, people knew the sensible way to write recipes. 
But then you have stuff like there's a crab gumbo recipe, which does list ingredients, but not all of them. So you can, you oh. can get your ingredients together and then suddenly be like, wait, you want me to add a can of tomatoes? You didn't say a can of tomatoes. <laughs> it also tells you that you need okra, but doesn't tell you what to do with it. Huh. Like, this this well, is not a great recipe. There are a lot of recipes in this book, so do you think it's just that they weren't proofread that well? I think probably, because they were basically were sent in from uh, suffragists, I should say, not suffragettes, ah. from, the male, um, from the UK and the US. Um, okay. Including people like the author of The Yellow Wallpaper. And like I said, ver- various um, politicians, uh, the first woman to head a US federal department, the second woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize, and various suffragettes and their husbands. Okay. Which is kind of wow. wild, but I feel like M- Mrs. L.O. Kleber, the compiler, should maybe have Maybe you've applied some level of, like, a critical eye to what was being sent in. Or maybe tried some of them out. Yeah. I mean, presumably they did make some of them. She claims that she tried almost all of them before putting okay. them in. I'm reading the one for cucumber sandwiches, and it just says slice the cucumbers, put them in between slices of bread. Yeah, the whole, wow. I mean, the whole sandwich section feels kind of unnecessary. <laughs> I have just had a culinary epiphany. I'm going to go and make a sandwich. <laughs> but I mean, it does also follow a section which talks about picking your, the colours of your salads to match your decor. <laughs> so I mean, I mean, I'm not, I'm not convinced how much cooking these women actually did themselves. I don't know, I kind of like the concept of um, food that matches your health. It's... When I got this, I thought it'd be like, you know, it'd be a, a fun little tidbit. There'd be some interesting recipes to try. And then I looked through it and you get stuff like that. Yeah, it it doesn't sound like this is particularly aimed at people who are doing all of the cooking themselves no or by people who are doing all of the cooking like there's the carrot (laughs) soup that i mentioned there's a roast duck which apparently you want rare right i'm I'm not convinced that's the best idea um i do want to tell you about the thing from this that i did make which is scripture cake scripture cake um so it it lists all the ingredients each of which has a bible verse after it which mentions said ingredient (laughs) oh because sure absolutely no instructions um and then it says follow solomon's advice for making good boys and you will have a good cake and then lists a verse from Proverbs, which is basically about how you should beat children. What? So, like, it's the combination of including that specific verse, and also the only advice you're giving me to make this cake is to beat the ingredients. Huh. So this is a code recipe. Like, like I say, I did make this cake, um, just using, you know, I know how to make a cake. I, I, I figured out what I was supposed to do with the ingredients, and it was pretty tasty. Oh. But also, that's not how you write a recipe. <laughs> oh. What did the cake look like? Um, it's it's just a it's just a fruit cake. It's got um figs and raisins and almonds in it, and some honey okay. and some. Yeah, that that sounds yeah, it, right. It doesn't say how much spice to put in? 
Um, it's just spices to taste. Oh, yeah. So it doesn't say how much or what kind of spice. I just put in some pudding spice. Because it's a fruitcake. Makes sense. It worked. It's probably what they had in mind. But again, this is not how you write a recipe. <laughs> it's a bit of a gimmick, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, if you like fruitcake, make some scripture cake. It's quite nice. <laughs> Oh wow. <laughs> this book is a lot more than I thought it was going to be. It it is a lot. Like it even has a section talking about making soap. Oh. I guess you like, can have a cake of soap. It has a soap recipe which has more more instructions than half the recipes in here. Um <laughs> you using a specific brand of lye. Um, and it claims that lamb drippings make the best soap. I, I have looked. I have not been able to find somewhere where I can get lamb dripping. I I want to try it. Because mm. like I've made tallow soap, I've made lard soap, I've made sunlight soap. I want to make suffrage soap. My dad. Um sometimes talks about how his uncle would get home from work every day and immediately be brought a slice of bread and dripping by his aunt and just like that doesn't sound like the most delicious snack it'll keep you going though wouldn't it yes it would but um he wasn't exactly down the mine. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just intrigued by the claim that specifically lamb dripping makes the best soap. Like, yeah, that's, I can't imagine that's it's that one. different to other fat. But also, there was a difference between the tallow soap and the lard soap, so maybe. And I need to find a way to get hold of some lamb fat. I think. I'm j I'm reading this excerpt, this this little quote from the Honourable Ben Lindsay in the cake section. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just in all moral issues, the women voters make a loyal legion that cannot be betrayed to the forces of evil. <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot of the letters are very like women are the ultimate force for good, so we should let them vote, which is okay. I believe that when the women see the beast, they will be the first to attack it. <laughs> Again, I like, I love it, but probably not for the reason that you originally meant. <laughs> yeah, like, I feel like it is another case like that first one of just whatever gets you there. <laughs> All right, come on, ladies, let's kill the devil. We'll force feed him albuminous beverages. <laughs> this is great. I'm enjoying this book. <laughs> like so, some of the stuff I'm genuinely interested in trying to make. Like there's a stuffed tomatoes recipe that sounds quite nice. Oh. Like I, I think it being from. Like nineteen fifteen US rather than nineteen fifteen UK really helps with like the variety of stuff in it. Cause I mean a, a recipe book from the UK from this era would be very like well the, the the middle class ladies make the middle class food and everything is, is very proper and and European. Mm -hmm. But like there's a Yeah, like there's a lot more spices than I would expect from something from like most parts of Northern Europe from the same period. Yeah, I, it does seem to even be... just the regular ing the regular recipes have like actual seasoning. Hmm. It does seem to have a few sort of. It, it's got a few recipes from like various places around the world like there's a 
ah, okay, there's a goulash recipe that doesn't have any paprika in it. Yeah, I'm not saying they're, they're all definitely good, but there's at least more variety. <laughs> there's also a delicious Mexican dish that doesn't have any spices except for gravy. <laughs> I, th I think I missed that one. What, what's that one? Uh, soak and scald a pair of sweetbreads, cut into small bits, take liquor from three dozen oysters, add to sweetbreads with three tablespoons of gravy from the roast beef and a quarter pound of butter, cook until sweetbreads are tender, add oysters, add a cup of cream, serve with or without toast. I mean, it sounds interesting. Yeah. If we have any Mexican listeners, please tell us if this is a real thing. Yeah, because like, I have to assume not all Mexican food is spicy. Yeah. Like, a lot of what I probably think of as Mexican food is, like, Tex-Mex. So... Yeah. You never know. It might be a real delicious Mexican dish. They also have a peanut butter soup, which I'm intrigued by, because it appears to oh. be peanut butter and ketchup and water and sweet milk. I don't know if fresh sweet milk is just a description of the milk, or if sweet milk is a thing. That sounds like just a milkshake. It's, it's like a hot peanut butter milkshake. What? With ketchup. No! I don't like that. But it's another one that says, yeah, salt, pepper, or other season to taste. So it's just like, put put some seasoning in it, I guess, if you want. Hmm. Oh, there's a section here titled nuts as a substitute for meat oh yeah there's like a whole vegetarian section hmm. although many are trying to eliminate so much meat from menus on account of its soaring costs hmm. yeah, Scientific it reminds, it reminds me a lot of the like sort of the very old stereotypes about vegetarians are just like ah you just eat, eat nut roasts all the time <laughs> It says in here that oh, nice. scientific analysis has proven that nuts contain more food value to the pound than almost any other food product known. So I wonder if that's true. I mean, nuts do have a lot of protein in, don't they? They have a lot of protein. But I, I, I feel the claim more food value to the pound, first of all, is very vague. Yeah. But secondly, I think also it ignores like a lot of the other stuff that is in meat that you would have to replace somehow. Like I... just eat just eating a lot of nuts all the time, you're not gonna get a lot of like iron or B twelve. Yeah, you need like different proteins, right? Yeah, I I don't I don't think because, like, obviously there's supplements you can take now. Mm. I don't think they had B12 supplements at that point. They certainly didn't have Marmite. I, I don't think this would have been a, a long-term solution. No, also I love that it says um, the discomfort from eating them is often due to insufficient mastication. <laughs> Just keep chewing it, you'll feel the benefit eventually. <laughs> Didn't chew it enough, did you? <laughs> so I just love the phrase insufficient mastication. <laughs> it's it's certainly a choice. <laughs> I guess it's more like, scientific sounding than not chewing it enough. Next time I get a stomach ache, I'm gonna be like, oh no, I insufficiently masticated my food. <clears throat> Excuse me, waiter. This food is insufficiently masticated. Wait, why is the waiter doing that to your food? What <laughs> restaurant are you going to? Don't you know in the fanciest restaurants they chew your food for you? 
Like a baby bird. Yeah. That's how you know that it's really fancy. <laughs> All these peasants sitting in these Michelin star restaurants cutting food for themselves. Is is this what happens if you get six Michelin stars? Yeah. That's how you do it. You get five and then you get the waiters to come and chew the food and you get a special sixth one. They had to go underground due to COVID. <laughs> Disgusting. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, Irvin S. Cobb. Women cannot make a worse mess of voting than men have. I mean, fair. Yeah. You're not wrong. I really like the bride's cake as well. Like, because you you've got all all these, all these different cake recipes, including like donuts and fruit cakes. And Ooh. then you have bride's cake, you think, ah, it'll be the, the traditional wedding cake of, of a, a big, rich fruit cake. Mm -hmm. Just a slightly dry sounding sponge. Mm. Also, I would like to rescind my support of Irvin S. Cobb because he then goes on to say that they should take the vote away from like worthless and unfit men who don't know how to use it and give it to intelligent women oh that that's a little bit eugenic Which, yeah i don't i don't trust you to determine who the unfit people are mr cobb mm. i don't trust anyone to do that <laughs> so there's bios of some of the contributors in the back and i've just found out that irvin cobb um wrote books two of which were adapted into films by john ford and hosted the seventh Academy Awards. That's not what I was expecting to hear. Well, and one of the other contributors um, had slaves. There's, there's a, a okay. mixed bag of contributors. Okay. I mean, presumably not in. 1915 Were you talking no, about like historical No, he I mean this guy was born in 1844. Yeah, okay. Wow. Hmm. Hmm. It's there's is a wild mix of people in here. This is this is a ride. Like, pro I, f I feel like it's a good demonstration of how people can, can be progressive in one area and not in another. Absolutely. But I do, I love the, there's a t like a, a short tips and tricks section called The Cook Says. Okay. Um, is, this, is this like at the end? Yeah. The end. Like the... There's one that's a way to make really fluffy sponge cake. Uh huh. But there's also just like a list of short tips. So some of which like are ones that I I do do. Okay. Um, like you know, put putting hard boiled eggs in cold water when they're done so they don't cook too long and the yolk doesn't go all weird. That makes sense. Or like mixing cocoa powder with a bit of sugar and some water before using it. Oh. Um, then things like when you're cooking peas, put a lettuce leaf in there to help them stay green. That one sounds cute. And um, prick brown bread with a needle before you bake it, and then there won't be holes in the crust. Oh. Which I'm I'm not sure I see the logic of that one. Playing steam escape. I, 
I don't know. But like some of these are genuinely good tips. Like, um, yeah. yeah, pie crust is best Ooh. kept cold in the making. To this end, an excellent substitute for a rolling pin is a bottle filled with ice water. Like, yeah, that I, that makes sense. I'll give you yeah, that. Yeah, I was just reading that. That that sounds like actually useful. Like this, this book is such a mix. <laughs> Like, there's good advice and good recipes and then some less good stuff. I mean, presumably that's, like, a product of getting, like, a lot of different people to send in stuff because, like, some of them will know what they're talking about and then some of them. <laughs> yeah, there is one contributor who says, ah, this is, this is according to my wife and one is, <laughs> this is according to my cook. Ah. Obviously, these people don't get named. Like, are you, are you really the contributor if you're sending in something that your cook told you? Mm. Like, the class stuff is real. Like, there's a a small. I think it's, I think it's meant to be a poem. Um, near the start, that's basically an ode to the cook. Uh, so yeah, yeah. How, how you know she gets up and she does her work, and and that's great. It, I'm I'm not sure what relevance it has to it being a suffrage cookbook. It's just a little poem about about the cook. Hmm. That's random. Yeah, it's kind of weird. But I, I do like so there's there's an introduction um which has this great sentence. Um the cookbook of the past was filled mainly with recipes for dainties rather than sane and wholesome dishes. The aim being to please the taste for the moment rather than to feed the body and the brain. Which I I really like as the introduction to a cookbook which has a whole section of invalid drinks. Like they're just like, this is a workhorse cookbook. None of none of your fripperies, your self-indulgent nonsense. This is food for real people. But also includes totally bogus recipes that are just humorous oh yeah this is food for real people who have cooks because <laughs> <laughs> again most of the recipes don't have cooking instructions and some of them miss out ingredients like you need someone who can actually cook to go through each one and figure out what you're actually supposed to be doing There's a totally bizarre line at the end of this introduction that says, in the broader view of the social world that is dawning upon us, the cookbook that tells us how to live right and well will largely supplant Shakespeare browning in the lurid literature of the day. It is a pretty hot take. Does that mean that, like, uh, people will read cookbooks in the, the good new world instead of Shakespeare? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's very wellness guru. Is literature bad for your digestion? Well, I I feel like they they see it as more more improving than all 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 of this nonsense ah, fiction. Morally improving, yes. Yeah, you know the sorts of books you would let your wives and servants read. <laughs> Well, everyone knows that novels are terribly bad for you, morally speaking. They are. They cause hysteria. <laughs> you need to just sit down with your beef eggnog and read your cookbook. <laughs> I'm not sure I can think of a worse evening. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
I think I think the worst evening is being the child being given the albuminized water. <laughs> and I know I keep coming back to it, but it's daft. <laughs> There's no other word for it, at least not that I can say on this podcast. It's very silly. I just uh somebody got somebody get me a copy of The Mysteries of Udolfo and the Bar of Chocolate Stat. <laughs> Just wait till Lady Chatterley's lover comes out. They'll be dropping like flies because they're not <laughs> reading their cookbooks instead. I just, I don't understand. I don't understand this way of thinking that's just like, well, if you eat right and avoid excitement, it's like, but do you want to live a really, really long time or do you want to have fun? Also, what if I like excitement? What if I want to be excited? Well, it's it's bad for you morally and physically, <laughs> and you should stop it at once. Oh no. Go go and make some soap. Let me just put all my endorphins back where they came from. <laughs> just jam them back into your brain. <laughs> no. Can't come out today, lads. No neurotransmitters for you. <laughs> Puts down chili, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, you can have spice to taste, remember? So spice is okay. Oh, okay. A little bit. Because if it, if it just says to spice things to taste, you can put whatever you want in there. Hey, you found a, leap, a loophole. A loophole? I found a loophole. Um, <laughs> although I suppose at the time that this was published, like... There's like a massive temperance movement and all sorts of clean living stuff going around, right? Yeah, I feel like it's it's the first wave of wellness, really. Because <laughs> that's what it is. It's yeah. just it's wellness. And like, quote unquote, respectable society was kind of obsessed with with this kind of stuff at the time. Mm. So, given that this seems to be very much aimed at, like, respectable ladies, um, it makes sense. But from a viewpoint of now, it is kind of hilarious. Yeah, there is a mention with the albuminous beverages of just, like, I promise this is relevant, um, of, you know, some, some people shun alcohol, and in that case, you can just not put alcohol in your drinks. Which, like, I mean, sure. But then it's just egg it juice. It's like an odd, an odd thing to, to specifically say, but you're not wrong. Also, are the beverages intended for ill people the only ones that have alcohol? Um, let me check. Oh yeah, it doesn't have a cocktail section, alas. I mean, yeah. albuminous cocktails were a thing. Is is the thing about that? I guess. I mean, yeah, that that is still a thing, right? Cocktails with egg in. I don't know yeah, why. Yeah, like the, but... there's one that says brandy or some other stimulant if required as one of the ingredients. <laughs> which first time I've ever seen brandy called a stimulant. Any stimulant, huh? Yeah. I eggnog with cocaine, anyone? <laughs> uh, interestingly, don't, don't give people ideas. Interestingly, though, it does also mention diabetes and oh. mentions a sweetener that you can use instead of sugar, which will also reduce the calories, which is, is great because we don't want to get fat while bedbound, as I said. Wow, this... I just... I can't get over how... How much of a mixed bag this book is. Yeah. But I mean, I, I have been skipping over a whole beverage section. There's also the starchy beverages. Ooh. Um, which, the, it mentions the digestion of starchy beverages. And I, I don't know 
whether it's stating this as a positive or negative. Um, says the action of um, Chaolin is very rapid, and if these drinks are sipped slowly, so as to be thoroughly mixed with saliva, a considerable portion of starch may be changed to sugar before reaching the intestines. I don't know if this is good or bad, whether you're supposed to drink it slowly or quickly as a result of this. Are you meant to just down these starchy drinks? Oh my god, there's one called Bread Panda. Oh no, it's Bread Panada. Oh. Not, not Bread Panda, sadly. That's, that's disappointing. <laughs> I want to try Bread Panda. But the fact that, because it talks about in the introduction to the starchy beverages chapter, how whole grains contain a lot of valuable minerals, um, but that these drinks don't have a lot of that. Huh. Um, but then you, but you should heat it so that more of more of the good stuff comes out and can be digested. But I, I still don't know whether the sugar content is meant to be good or bad in this case. But it does also mention the calories, and there is more than one recipe for rice water. There's also an Osatz coffee you can make out of round, like, stale brown bread. Oh, I love all the things that you can make fake coffee out of. Bread water doesn't sound like it would make a good fake coffee, though. Thing is, there's that, and then there's separately toast water. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, it's basically the same it's, thing. But it's one just... of them is presented as coffee, and one of them is presented as a nourishing drink. To which you know you could add milk or cream or sugar like you do with coffee, but it's not the Ursatz coffee one, that's separate. <laughs> um, uh -huh. Wow. I'm not sure how I feel about toast water. Yeah, it's... It's bread drink. It is, it is bread drink. <laughs> it's a joke that no one listening will get. Literally. I do love it. Um, yeah, one of the rice waters says about yeah. Tells you, you know, give you give you some tips to use rice water to make you less, like make you have the diarrhea less, um, oh. or to reduce a laxative condition. And then a separate rice water recipe which uses raisins and then says. Do not use raisins in bowel trouble. Oh no! But like, which, which way? I feel like we need to know which way the raisins will influence your bowel trouble. Because, you know, if they make one worse, maybe they make the other one better. Yeah, maybe if you're in certain kinds of bowel trouble, you might want to use the raisin. But we don't know which bowel trouble it is. <laughs> So this is this is useless advice, madam. Yeah, I'm not going to use any of this until I know. I see that this is another section that has a spe a separate one for infant feeding, barley water. I'm I'm not sure how helpful barley water would be just as a general food, but it says that it's good if they've got diarrhea, which hmm. I think it's one of those things that is sort of meant to be nourishing, like in an old-fashioned way. I mean, it, it makes a kind of sense, because I, I know that for rehydration, because you get like oral rehydration solution hmm. and things made with water and grain are meant to be good for it, so like there might be some logic there. Okay. But it's described more as just a drink for them, which can also be useful for that. And like, I, I feel like they wouldn't want that most of the time. It's there's some very confusing notes in this book. There's a recipe for synthetic quince. Mm. Um. Which is, I put too much water with my rhubarb and had a whole dish full of beautiful pink juice left over. 
In this, I cooked some apples and added a saucer full of strawberries. The result being served looked and tasted exactly like quince. Which is interesting. Yeah, I, I, I like that one because it almost starts out like a recipe blog. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like it's an accidental discovery. I Is quince particularly expensive at this point? Um, it it can be hard to get and is also seasonal. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Like depending where you are, it can be difficult to get. I'm not sure I've ever eaten a quince. But I mean, people also just liked ersatz foods kind of for funsies sometimes at this point. Well, we do have the modern parallel of things made out of cake that don't look like cake. Those things are not made out of cake. They are made of fondant and lies, and I will die on this hill. <laughs> Some of them are made out of cake. There's cake in there, but it's made of fondant and lies. <laughs> but, you know, the, I I think that's in the same vein as people liking ersatz foods just for funsies. It is, but also fondant <laughs> and lies. I know you have feelings about about the fake cakes about the cake fakes <laughs> the cake fakes the fakey cakeies <laughs> I think I just don't like fondant I like it but not too thick um so yeah that is the suffrage cookbook um, I, w I will put a, a Project Gutenberg link in the episode description if you want to check it out for yourself. Uh, if you do end up making any of the recipes, do let us know. Um, email us at breadandthreadpodcast at gmail.com or se send us a picture at breadandthread on Twitter or Tumblr. I would love to see what some of these things look like in the flesh. And it tastes like yeah I mean like I said it it takes a bit of fiddling and figuring stuff out but the scripture cake is quite nice for a fruit cake mm. um but yeah so there's those those are the ways to contact us I realize I've said the bit that Hazel normally says and um, do you want to plug the patreon uh, sure, we have a Patreon. It is Bread and Thread. You can find recipes and Discord servers and uh, good things. Uh, did we have a Twitter? Did you say the Twitter? I, I, I said the Twitter and the Tumblr and the email. Excellent. Okay. Uh, I don't think the, we have any the, other... Just look for Bread and Thread somewhere and we'll probably pop up. <laughs> Whisper bread and thread after running three times around a yew tree in a churchyard at midnight, and we will arrive and give you historical recipes. That's that's true. That's how me and Nick met. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you for listening, and we'll be back soon.